Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to kick it off with the state of open source security. I want to talk with you about high level view of everything that happens on language based software ecosystems, containers, technologies, um, projects of open source maintainers and developers as well. So quick introduction about myself. My name is uh, Liran Tal. I'm a developer advocate at Sneak, where we build developer friendly security tooling to help developers uh, build secure applications. I'm also involved with the Node.js security working group um, and a bunch of other activities across OWASP and uh, publishing uh, books. If you want to follow me on Twitter and ask me anything about us, I'm happy to help. And I'll be here the whole day and during the Collaborator Summit. So you know, just find me around. So kicking off. Um, today, I think nobody would question the fact that open source has made an incredible impact on modern software development. And it continues to expand every year. GitHub had reported that 2018 had seen more new users signing up than all of its first six years combined. So open source software is really everywhere, and contributions are made across all languages and platforms, impacting growth across different industries, and undoubtedly an essential part of business technology strategy. In 2018, actually, Java packages doubled, and PM added about 250K packages as well. And we actually surpassed already 1 million packages early, early 2019, so this year. Uh, around June on, on NPM. So the use of open source is accelerating. However, with great adoption of open source comes great responsibility and risk that we need to mitigate, you know, whether we are owners of open source, maintainers of open source, or just using open source software. In 2018, vulnerabilities for NPM grew by 37%. PHP and Maven had grew by uh, considerable percentage, percentages as well, something around 27 and 56% respectively. So we're seeing uh, all in all about 88% growth of application security vulnerabilities in the last uh, two years. What is really interesting is that vulnerable versions have a long tail of downloads. How, in other words, how long does it take for users to adapt to a new version that has a fix from an old one that is vulnerable? How long does that take? So we turned into a, a Python, the PyPy registry. Um, and they took a look at a, at a pretty popular, fairly popular package called uh, WebSocket. We found uh, that even though it has a high denial of service vulnerability, disclosed in August, you can see that downloads have been, you know, thousands of downloads, or tens of thousands of downloads have been actually accumulating even after that. So people are still downloading vulnerable versions of that. Or this could be for different reasons, you know, maybe there's a, you know, a legacy, maybe there's uh, issues to upgrade to, to a fix, but Considering this fact, you know, we're still getting those long tails of downloads, even for vulnerable versions. This trend is actually increasing uh, uh, of security vulnerabilities, even across you know, uh, well-known system libraries. So whether you look at um, uh, things like you know, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Debian, SUSE, all of those Linux distros, you know, we're seeing those same trends of increasing you know, CVEs and security vulnerabilities being reported, being disclosed. And we'll get to that in a bit, uh, but I will say that you know, those CVEs that we're seeing here at you know, Linux OS libraries are not something far away from us. Actually, they manifest in the container technology that we're using, you know, most probably, to power applications and bundle them with them. So kind of transi transitively, we are being affected and impacted by these vulnerabilities. So let's take a look at what happens um, in language-based software ecosystems and you know, how much do we rely and know about those open source dependencies that we use. So a recent academic research paper had actually investigated the characteristics and properties of different language-based ecosystems. Uh, it took, for example, Python, uh, PyPy, the PyPy registry, and also NPM. Try to compare and figure out you know, what is different, what is uh, familiar and similar around those. What it found out for NPM specifically is that 61% of all packages on NPM could be considered abandoned packages. Now straight out, that seems you know, very outrageous uh, you know, proposition to say. But it depends what you, you know, how, what, is, what is your opinion on what is, or what, how do you measure what is uh, uh, an abandoned package, right? So for the sake of this research paper, and you know, research paper being you know, something easily to consume, uh, we have decided, or you know, the researchers have decided, that an abandoned package will be that which did not have a release in the last 12 months. So rightfully so, you could go ahead and argue back that uh, you know, last 12 months did not have a release, maybe that package had reached maturity, you know, maybe it's already so well known and well developed, it does not need any more new releases, everything is fine. Except event stream incident happened, a security issue uh, that kind of, uh, I'm pretty sure some, of, some people in the room have heard of, if not there's a whole uh, post-mortem, you will not have a, a problem finding and Googling this uh, information. 
uh, but just to like put it into, into like a small uh, uh, disclaimer of what was going under, event stream has been on the, on the NPM registry for like almost eight or nine years since then. It's definitely mature, did not see any release in the last two or three years, uh, but someone through a social engineering technique was able to go ahead over overtake uh, publishing access, you know, um, and, and through that, you know, being able to inject a malicious package inside transitive dependencies of event stream that you would usually uh, also probably will use not as a direct one, but as a transitive dependency. So through all of that, injecting something into a package that's being downloaded about two million times a week. Another interesting insight that this research paper pointed out was that if you take a look at what you install, your average NPM install, there's a whole difference between what happens on Python, for example, to NPM. So for NPM, your average NPM install for a package would pull in four levels deep of nested dependencies, which means this is you know, great if you're like tracking something like Express or Fastify, uh, but at, at the same time, they're gonna pull in you know, a bunch of those other dependencies as well that you need to track and understand as well. Have this, the exact mindset of a security risk of what's going on there. Let's do a mental exercise. Imagine you're building Node.js app. Your mental image of the application is this you know, following blob where you see you know, your application being deployed or you know, being used somewhere. Except the reality, however, is that the actual code that you write, right, the actual code that we write as developers, is significantly smaller amount than what we actually ship out. So your, your mental image of your application might be a bit distorted towards the reality of what you actually wrote versus uh, all the app that you are actually responsible for as well. Because all of us are relying on open source software and community powered code, which is you know, leveraging this beautiful open source world and boost our productivity, but we need to understand this concept of what we write and you know, what is not ours and then what is our risk and responsibility towards those dependencies as well. So granted, it is I think hard to imagine these days writing software, delivering products without being reliant on any kind of open source uh, software or dependency. And you know, managing dependencies for a project is an important task. And it requires due diligence, you know, tracking those dependencies that you use and that you rely upon and making sure that everything is okay. After all, the application that you're deploying is making use of that code and you know, bundles that as part of your dependencies. So we wanted to understand what is going on in terms of where do we find security vulnerabilities. This is all, uh, like most of this is part of uh, the, open, the state of open source security report that we published in which we have taken a look at what happens both for uh, users of Sneak and the, the ecosystem itself, et cetera. And what we found for this example is 78% of the time when we will find security vulnerabilities for users you know, using Sneak is we will find it for NPM in transitive dependencies. So again, going back to that example, if you are you know, a JavaScript or a Node developer, you're tracking all of the Fastify change logs all of the Angular and React change logs, et cetera, most of the time, 78% of those, when we find security vulnerabilities for your project as we scan it, as we offer you fixes for it, it will not be for that direct dependency that you will use. It will actually be most of the time for those transitive dependencies. You can see this is actually a bit different between um, different ecosystem, which is, you know, could say a lot about what's going on with our ecosystem, but I will not go into that right now. So what can possibly go wrong with transitive dependencies in my applications? So I have a whole different talk about what is happening with malicious packages on ecosystems, um, and I won't relate into one, one of them, and these are all examples and use cases of things that happened in security incidents that happened in the ecosystems. I'm gonna drill into something that's called get cookies. Get cookies sounds, uh, I guess, pretty simple in terms of what it does. It parses HTTP headers for cookie data. Or does it? So actually, Get cookies is nothing less than a command and control backdoor. Its sole purpose of allowing someone to attack your web server through sending command injections remotely. So any web server that would bundle this dependency would actually allow a malicious attacker remotely knowing this vulnerability to go ahead and inject any kind of arbitrary code into your app. How does it does so? So the whole kind of exploit code in get cookies is roughly 40 lines of code. I've actually summed up the uh, important part here. To process this uh, remote code injection, uh, it has like a simple switch case, does three things. Reset the buffer, load data into the buffer, which in our case will be JavaScript code, and then execute whatever is on the buffer. So someone having control on this web server could go ahead, you know, input, inject malicious JavaScript code through things like HTTP headers. This will process it, you know, reset it, and run it. Now the attacker had built a whole pyramid of nested dependencies to hide get cookies behind them. 
Mind you, all of these three dependencies are actually offsprings of the same attacker, right? All of them belong to the same one. But one or two or three malicious packages on NPM having one billion packages inside will not you know, be that much of a threat, as in who would go ahead and install get cookies which has maybe zero downloads. So without a vessel to propagate this and you know, kind of claim trust, it's gonna be hard. So what this attacker was able to do is compromise this library called mail parser, which has something like half a million downloads on the, on the, you know, on the registry, and through that, you know, be able to push those dependencies into the mail parser project. Now, mail parser itself is not a web server, so having that bundled in or even required in use may not have been put you on harm's way, but perhaps this was all done in order to provide some legitimacy in terms of someone searching for a get cookies management package and sees something gets downloaded half a million times, well, maybe I'll use it. So this kind of malicious packages happen all the time. Here's an example from the uh, NPMJS advisories. Uh, you can find that also as like a sneak of uh, all advisories. Doesn't really matter which one you're tracking, except I wanted to give you the fact that all of these malicious packages, different kind of type of squatting attacks, happen all the time, right? This is November 27. This is just like two weeks ago. How do we handle all of that? How do we you know, mature into being responsible to our open source dependencies to what do we install? For the sake of that, I've created a project a while back called NPQ. What it does is when you do an NPQ install something like jQuery, as you can see here, this is a wrong abbreviation of jQuery because this is actually uh, a type of squatted package. It will go and do some due diligence. It will check, for example, how much is this package? Is it something that gets 20 downloads? Is it just new? Someone is trying to maliciously inject users? Or is it something that gets downloaded a million times a month to probably get some kind of trust from the community around it? Does it have a repository, uh, open source repository associated with it to allow you to go ahead you know, and, and ensure that there's like an open source code base that you can inject, et cetera? Maybe it has vulnerabilities in it. Why would you not know about it before installing it you know, rather than after the fact and then finding out ways to mitigate it? So here's one example that we can go ahead and use to be a bit more responsible. And security vulnerabilities happen all the time, whether you're using uh, uh, you know, different uh, types of language ecosystems. Here is Marked, for example, a very popular uh, markdown parsing library for Node and JavaScript kind of used between the, uh, the server and the front end as well. Uh, you can see that there's a fix for it uh, for like a redos vulnerabilities happened you know, just a while back, right? Just a few, few months back. And the interesting thing about vulnerabilities, uh, at least in the last two years, is that they have a bit shifted in terms of the trend that we're looking at. So when 2016, as we look at, you know, the high and medium uh, have like a, a kind of uh, um, ratio where there's more high, uh, medium than high, in the last two years, we've seen this ratio actually uh, flip. So more of these vulnerabilities that we're seeing actually high than medium. So most developers and maintainers, I think, would agree that security should play an important role when we're building our applications. Except there are no textbooks on how do you build secure applications. There are so many guidelines and OS kind of like um, um, standards or like semi-standards, but there's no like open source maintainer in this room that would you know, say I'm following this and that standard and this is how I do secure code. So standards can also vary between different projects, which means you know, one project can follow very good and highly secure uh, guidelines, secure coding conventions, et cetera, but another open source project, you know, very, very uh, uh, you know, popular in the, same, in the same sense, would not follow those as well. So all of these security standards things for open source projects is, is very varied uh, uh, in terms of how it is done. So just in this year's 2019 State of the Octoverse report uh, from GitHub, security was actually the most popular project integration app category. And the more we use open source software, I think that we realize this risk that we accumulate upon ourselves as we're trying to use someone else's code in our application. And having automated tools that we can use in our, in our CIs is utmost important, right? Because this is how we're gonna be able to scale up security as part of the way that we scale up the delivery of our application's code. So through this survey, we asked some questions for maintainers and developers. Um, in this part, uh, we asked uh, open source maintainers to rate their security knowledge and how good that is. So we found that 70% of open source maintainers would actually not feel that confident in handling a security issue if it was disclosed to them. So averaging their security knowledge somewhere around 6.6 .6 out of 10. Moreover, as much of, you know, we're seeing adoption of CI tools, whether that's like things like Circle CI, for example, to help us, uh, you, know, you know, have a, have a good uh, CI, CD uh, kind of um, uh, pipeline thing. Uh, they still go underutilized, so you know, we're not enabling, you know, we're not empowering that, that CI integration that we have for applications, this DevOps pipeline to go ahead and, and, and put security into it. 
as a testament of that, you know, when we asked uh, developers, you know, how often or what is the cadence of like their uh, security auditing, one of four open source maintainers do not perform any sort of, any sort of security auditing uh, for their projects. So security practices are taking many different shapes and forms, and some of which are really easy wins. For example, choosing a really good password so your package would not get compromised, right? Like mail parser, like many other packages and incidents that were happening before on the ecosystem. Another option is, for example, to enable 2FA in your, in your code, whether, whether that is um, you know, the NPM package registry or Docker Hub or something like that. But how often are we doing that? So what is the state of 2FA, for example, in the NPM uh, ecosystem? Well, as we look back into it, and uh, 2FA had been available on NPM since the late 2017, and maybe despite the fact that it had been there for so long, there's only a very small percentage of, of the ecosystem of developer, developers and maintainers actually enabling that. And this accounts for also a very small, insignificant amount of packages out of the whole million packages happening on NPM itself. So it's the responsibility of all of us enabling 2FA making that possible for us, making the security possible for users consuming open source software. Interesting take is how does this affect and how does this look like in adjacent ecosystems? For example, what's the state of open source uh, of, of 2FA, for example, in, in Docker Hub as an ecosystem? Well, funny thing is, it's 0%. And there's a whole funny story around it, and that's kind of accurate to October 1st, which I'll, I'll get to in, in a minute. And why does that happen? Because somewhere around uh, June, someone on the uh, Docker uh, uh, repository chimed in on this issue and said, you know, we're planning to rolling out uh, uh, this multi-factor authentication at the end of June. Everyone were thumbs up. Great. Amazing. Let's do it. Accept. It didn't happen. Someone chimed in in July and said, you know, hey, hey, we're July. What's up? You said June. And then came August. You know, someone chimed in again and said, you know, this is August. What's going on, fellas? How are we doing there? I like it that they are giving the uh, uh, programmers kind of uh, uh, perspective into it. I'm a programmer myself. How hard can it be? All right. So we didn't have it back in, in July, back in August. Uh, guess what happened in September? Nothing much. We did not have 2FA available there. Um, reminding you that we're talking about Docker Hub. This is a very primary registry for Docker container, probably powering a lot of applications uh, uh, for everyone in this room, including myself. And October coming up, right? What, are we, what is happening there? So there's an interesting update. Uh, we've been rolling out personal access tokens, which is not the same as 2FA, uh, but you know, maybe, a, maybe a step in a good direction, except you know, we need to remind them that maybe we need 2FA. And you know, then it happened. Everyone are happy. So I hope after this talk, everyone is going to have 2FA enabled on Docker Hub and on NPMJS. So the security blind spot of Lockfile, I want to talk about this as an example of going back again to maintainers and you know, open source activities. And how often are, have we, as maintainers and as developers, are kind of put in this autopilot mode where we didn't even consider the security risk of you know, an attack vectors of things that we do as like a day-to-day -day activities uh, for the most basic things. So I'll give you an example. Here is a pull request I opened on GitHub. Um, at, uh, you can see that I have actually uh, part of this pull request for a real project. I actually changed some dependencies as I needed to. Uh, it's part of my uh, uh, contribution. You can see that my yarn log file is actually not being displayed because we take that kind of uh, for granted. It's a machine generated thing. Is there anything that I need to look at? Maybe not. You know, there's a whole lot of code being changed as well. Uh, so it's kind of collapsed and you know, do not show you all of that. And if I will open this up and show you what were my contributions along this dependency update, along the code that I actually uh, added as well, maybe the, those of you will, uh, with a good eyesight here will actually see that on the left, I'm actually changing something that is an actual package that is being used from the registry. And you can see on the right that my change is actually using the exact same package, but from my own controlled domain, whether that's like a, an NPM proxy mirror, or I can already install it directly, as you can install NPM packages from GitHub, and it has malicious code in it. So as you will merge this pull request, we'll probably not see it, because you, know, you did not even take care of, uh, go ahead and you know, reviewing what's in a, in a log file, go ahead and merge it. Maybe you're at this point when you're doing an NPM install the next time, any of those uh, developers who usually, you know, in a, a log file is usually being used for application developers of a project specifically, not the consumers of it, you might be susceptible to this uh, injection attack. So why don't we have tools to help us with these very simple things? So there we go. I built uh, this thing called log file lint. Uh, I think as JavaScript developers, we 
heavily rely on static analysis and linters. So there we go, another one that you can add to your CI, block file lint, you can tell it to validate that everything is first of all HTTPS, uh, specific sources, what are you using, you know, just NPM or just yarn, don't want anyone to inject anything from GitHub or anything other uh, uh, like that. There we go, another tool that you can go ahead and use in your CI. Perhaps a silver lining in, in most of this uh, uh, talk, I would say, you know, well, we're not doing that bad, but uh, across the ecosystem, but I would say, what is the silver lining here as we ask developers and maintainers, you know, who is, the, who is like actually responsible for security? And the most of the respondents have been around developers. And this is great because we're seeing this, you know, strong statement, you know, strong testament of developers being like full stack. And it's not just owning, you know, the DevOps or, or the backend and the front end. It's also being, you know, responsible for things like performance of applications, accessibility requirements. Uh, how about uh, security for applications as well? Understanding the risk of, uh, for us as maintainers of open source software to actually like mitigate and, and push out security fixes is really, really important in terms of how are we actually rolling this out. So I wanna show you an example, it happened uh, not a whole long time ago. Uh, this is a GitHub project for uh, a very popular NPM package. Doesn't remember, uh, doesn't matter the name because these kind of things happen all the time, but I'm giving you one example where someone was chiming in and saying, oh, there's a vulnerability that was reported, uh, there's a link to the sneak phone, um, you know, telling uh, the person to go ahead and release, like the owner of this uh, package, to go ahead and release like a new version so this can be consumed as a fix for, uh, for, for the package that they are relying upon as a transitive debt that has a vulnerability in it. The maintainer did get involved, right? This did happen, you know, everyone were uh, proactive about doing it, except, you know, I think kind of like lack of education of how you mitigate security issues, it was published as a major version. So if version two is vulnerable and you publish as a maintainer uh, a fix in version three, that's gonna be a bit tricky because being having an automated upgrade from two to three has different semantic meanings to it. Maybe an API was broken, maybe you know, a, C, a very elaborate CI will not go ahead and update it because they are afraid that this will break their, uh, their applications. So there's a whole lot of you know, a security education, not in terms of how you write secure code, but also how do you push that, how do you make that available to users to consume it in a very seamless way that you know, automated upgrades, things like you know, Dependabot or, or sneak uh, upgrade PRs would be able to go ahead and pull in those new uh, versions for you. So there's a whole lot of best practices for open source maintainers. Uh, I've got this uh, uh, cheat sheet. Um, some of it is uh, kind of left here. Uh, you can find it online as well. I've worked on that with uh, Juan Picado, who is the maintainer of Redaccio, a local NPM proxy. He's been doing an amazing job as well uh, for open source. Um, so moving on. What about open source dependencies impacting container security technology? What is this increase of adoption, I think, around Docker and you know, the strong growth of, around open source that we're seeing? And it's expected to grow more and more. We're talking about more than one billion downloads uh, happening probably every one or two weeks on the container registry. Uh, Docker Hub reported about uh, one million applications in, in, in the form of container images uh, being uploaded uh, to the registry uh, in the last, in the, to the Docker Hub registry, uh, sh I should say in the last year. So this is, you know, very, uh, very much fueling our open source growth. Except Docker images, you know, almost always bring known vulnerabilities alongside their great value. So if we take a look at, you know, just scanning those 10 most popular Docker images on Docker Hub, just, you know, scanning the, the you know, most popular page of all of those images, you would find that if you just get the default images of each of them, they at least have each 30 vulnerabilities inside them. Notice, you know, presumably uh, here uh, with 580 as well. So most of those vulnerabilities actually originate from the base image of your application. So this is why it is so crucial to understand, you know, what are you using as a base or as a parent image in your Docker file? If you're using something like Debian uh, Jesse, you're gonna pull in something like 700 uh, dependencies. If you're using something like um, um, Buster or uh, Jesse Slim or some other variations of it, you're gonna pull smaller images, you know, smaller dependencies of OS libraries inside them and thus also you're gonna pull in uh, less vulnerabil uh, vulnerabilities as well. That's a smaller image. And the thing is that fixing it can be really easy. So if you understand, if you know this fact, you know, you, you understand that fixing it is something that is very easy to do. For example, 44% of those Docker image vulnerabilities can just be, uh, you know, fixed if you change to a newer image. If you do not use node latest or node 10, but you use node 10 slim, for example. Here is, here is, here is the, uh, um, the, the open source vulnerabilities uh, in each of those image tags for Docker Hub. So you can see that using node 10 will pull in 582 vulnerabilities into that image just by using, you know, just by using that. You're vulnerable to this amount of vulnerabilities. Now, sure, granted, may, they may not all be exploitable. They may not have all exploits in the wild, but why would you ship by default almost 600 vulnerabilities with your Docker application? There's no sane way 
or same reason to do that. Use a different image, except I know it is not that, you know, uh, it's a bit of a, of a smarty kind of uh, way for me to just go ahead and say it, but we need a tool to help us do this. This is, you know, an example of how stick test that you can use other tools as well, but the idea of tooling, friendly tooling that help us uh, uh, figure out, you know, well, maybe you should, I, I detected that you're using node.10 something, it has uh, uh, 900 almost uh, vulnerabilities, you can consider moving to any of these other alternative images that you can try and use and mitigate and, uh, the security risks that you have. So instead of having pulling in 862 vulnerabilities, you'll be pulling in only 54 of them, which you know, may be an acceptable risk in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, in your workplace. The, only th the other thing that uh, we should uh, kind of like pay attention to is that just by rebuilding an image, we can, uh, we can go ahead and mitigate 20% of those Docker image vulnerabilities because rebuilding an image may pull in depending on how the image is built. You know, when new apps get updates, so new upgrades coming in and pulling in newer versions if nothing is, uh, uh, have been pinned by the uh, dependency manager inside uh, the OS itself. So we're talking a lot about container technology and you know, we also asked some, people, some questions about this. So when do you scan your Docker images? right, for OS vulnerabilities. Interestingly, even though security is such an important part, even though there's a whole trend of security uh, TVs going on in Linux OSs, 50% of developers will fail to do so. They will not scan those dependencies, even if it is something that is very easy to do. Many tooling available free, and some, some of them are open source as well. You can go ahead and, and, and check that. What about uh, you have those uh, containers deployed to production? What about going ahead and testing this on production? Because unlike functions, which are very short-lived, Docker, uh, Docker containers could be very long-lived. You could have a very legacy service, a microservice that the team is using has been deployed to production. No, no one had you know, pushed any update onto it. It's been running for like a month or two. It is now in production. Maybe there are new CVEs affecting it, something like a new hard bleed or whatever uh, that could be uh, impacting it. Still, 50%, almost 50% of uh, developers or engineers would not even find out about it. So I guess another silver lining for uh, container technology is that developers are still, even for, that, for, for the sake of Docker images and Docker files and stuff like that, you know, with the empowerment, I think, of, of developers to kind of own their infrastructure as well, uh, we're seeing a good, uh, I think, a good and positive trend in terms of you know, us as developers owning the security of our container technology as well. So some best practices around uh, Docker image security uh, that you can find, there's a whole kind of linters and how to scan them and you know, very easy uh, things that you can go ahead and, and pull into your pipeline. Uh, it's, uh, you can go ahead and like, ping me afterwards, I'll give you all the links and all this will be available after the talk as well. But I would, I would wanna end off uh, with, uh, with kind of like this note where attackers are kind of, kind of targeting open source because you know, finding one vulnerability, one CVE affecting you know, Fastify, Angular, or whatever uh, kind of open source project that you may use, is also kind of translates into many victims because there's always a lot of users for these open source packages. So if something has you know, a very large popularity, it means they'll probably be able to infect or you know, attack a lot of consumers as well as not everyone may be up to date, not everyone may be rolling out patches and upgrades as fast as they can. And this is why it is so easy for attackers to just target open source software. What if security was a bit easier, was kind of more developer friendly, was actually actionable, so not just allowing you uh, to like learn about there's a new vulnerability, but actually fixing it for you. Like opening a, a pull request to let you know, uh, I will tell you that I will upgrade uh, your, uh, uh, your, your, de your dependency because I wanna pull in a new version for that, maybe a smart minor version upgrade and not pull in the latest version to not break your, your apps. What if it was something that you would just push into your CI, uh, example showing Snake, but you can use NPM audit or, or as dependency checks in your uh, CI tooling as well. But what if like, you would have this security integrated into your pipeline, into your workflow? So when someone adds a new vulnerable package, when someone adds you know, a new security vulnerability to a transitive package, your CI breaks, right? You're a bit more conscious in how to do this in a more uh, uh, significantly considerable way, more responsible way to protect your open source uh, dependencies. So thank you for much. Uh, uh, use open source, you know, stay awesome, uh, stay responsible. Thank you. I think we have time for questions if anyone is, uh, yes. So when does the community become almost too polluted where it's, uh, where it's like a ball of yarn to these folks that it's just, that it's just not safe to even enter that? It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure we are defining uh, a specific ecosystem like NPM, if that's what you mean, as, as polluted. 
as in Java would have you know a similar amount of depend of like open source vulnerabilities growth in, in a similar kind of it's not like a, a not like an order of magnitude difference it's kind of the same uh, playing field as well um, it, it is more about I think understanding the security risk and being able to do something about them understanding you know what you should be responsible for and not taking those things for granted so I don't think like a specific industry is polluted or not um, th there's a whole uh, if, if you go and uh, dive into the report itself you would see that we actually looked into um, kind of very uh, um, early stage growth uh, um, ecosystems like Go um, um, that would have, you know, they, they also have kind of like this trend of increasing vulnerabilities. And uh, even though it has like a whole significant amount of uh, security vulnerabilities in total compared to something else, but you could attribute that to, you know, maybe Go isn't that uh, popularly used. Maybe uh, security researchers are simply not looking at it to go ahead and find vulnerabilities there. So this whole kind of wide range of what would be uh, the reasons that we're not seeing this in Go versus, you know, NPM or Java, for example. Yes. Go ahead, yeah. Awesome. There was a vulnerability uh, revealed yesterday by NPM. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. What is your take on it? Sure. So um, glad you are bringing this up. So actually, the security researcher who found this, his name is Daniel Roof. He's actually involved with uh, Verdaccio and a bunch of other projects. He's a very security-minded uh, um, developer as well. He's not a security researcher by profession. Um, and what he discovered is if you're using um, NPM or Yarn, uh, they, they both, so the NPM kind of like, not the ecosystem itself, but like the, the tooling around it allows you to distribute binary files. So you could go ahead and, you know, uh, the way that I was building this NPQ and lock file in CLIs, you could go and build an, uh, a CLI where you install something, make it global, NPM or Yarn as a client will go ahead and make, you know, make the whole path and symlinks changes. So anywhere in your, uh, in your uh, 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 shell kind of prompt thing, you would go ahead and be able to uh, run commands. The thing that uh, uh, Daniel found is that you could have, he called it, like we call it uh, terminology as like a bean planting. The idea is that if say, um, one, one, uh, one NPM dependency, we can take uh, you know, whatever example you want, but if one uh, defines a specific uh, uh, bin file to be executed, like a CLI, uh, and installs it, and, there's, there, then, and then there's like another one like the, that you install, so like a different package that you install, but it uses the same kind of, of name for, uh, for that bin uh, CLI, it will override the original one that was created before that. So you could actually say, you know, uh, for example, if you're using um, Yeoman, which you know, I'm going to go uh, a completely uh, hardcore, uh, retro, old school kind of thing, using Yeoman as a CLI, um, I could go ahead and, and create this Yeoman dash two, whatever, get you to install it. Once you install it, I will actually be able to override the original uh, Yo command, Yo, that Yeoman had actually declared. So I'm actually being able to override something else. Uh, it is, you could say that you could do the same thing with scripts. So basically when you install something, you could just go ahead and do a, like a post install scripts and do the exact same thing, except NPM and Yarn has this uh, ignore scripts, which is a convention that, you know, security convention that you should probably uh, understand and use. Uh, but even if that is used, this kind of bin, pan, uh, bin planting could still happen. So it is still a very uh, uh, significant security issue. Uh, interesting uh, to say about it is that PNPM has not been vulnerable to all of the cases that we've seen. Um, and it actually warns you if, like, if you're trying to override something that already exists. So yeah, if you are using NPM and Yarn, you should probably update to the latest version so that you're not vulnerable to that. Um, the only way to kind of like become vulnerable to that is if a dependency is being installed and you know declaring those um, those bin files, uh, which is something that you know could happen if you install it uh, like specifically, like an NPM install something, or maybe that gets installed as a transitive dependency as well. So you know we don't have a lot of control on what what gets there. No, I don't think there have been. Now that we've seen, it's a fairly new issue. Uh, Daniel uh, actually uh, consulted with me about it. We talked with Snake security team. We involved both uh, NPM security team um, as well as Yarn. Uh, Mile is the core maintainer for Yarn. We actually contacted, contacted all of them kind of to uh, uh, consolidate all of this uh, messaging and communications and have all been, uh, like NPM and Yarn have been releasing uh, security updates. So we haven't, this is like freshly news from like the last four days or something. Um, there, there is one through GitHub that they have requested. I don't, I don't know if it's like have already been a, a block assigned, uh, but there is like a, a three CVEs as far as I remember um, concerning all of this for NPM specifically. Yes. 
This one? Yep. And uh, not only that, uh, the total amount of uh, pieces are the map. Yep. Right? It is. And you graph that. Yeah, I graphed that as well. It's basically uh, this one. Uh, so you can see there's like also Goland uh, and others. What is it? Yeah, yeah, that was just NPM specific. As far as I remember, that was the one, yeah. This one for ecosystem, you can see there's growth for everything. Uh, Golang as well, uh, it's all kind of growth. And, and that's how you were talking about it, that's how it's I think historically, yes, because like you can see uh, from uh, uh, the Linux OS, that's all, it's almost going, you know, uh, I, w I won't say exponential, I do not want to go there. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, that's kind of taking uh, that trend. I would say, you know, um, being a bit more, um, conscious about what does this mean. So first of all, for NPM um, and JavaScript, we have been having a lot of uh, activity around that. So the, the security working group being there, you know, being a bit more active and vigilant on what's going on, assigning CVEs. So there's, there's also been like a lot of activity. So obviously like there will be more CVEs as well if no one had looked at it before. So that contributes. The other, the other thing is not everything is, you know, exploitable. So you have, you know, you, you may be uh, vulnerable to like some high uh, issues. Like for example, Jest may have a redos attack versus whatever, but you need to understand that, you know, Jest is maybe a, a dev dependency, you're not deploying it after production. So that is not something, you know, uh, specifically to like worry about, right? Under a, a kind of like a statement here. So there's a whole kind of like prioritization, understanding, you know, what is an actual risk, you know, what is a, a manifested risk and what is something uh, that may not impact you. That said, I would say, you know, you do not want to go into production with having like 20 low vulnerabilities if you can just lower that to zero with like zero effort, right? So you do want to go ahead and mitigate uh, these security risks if you can, uh, as much as possible. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> 